the second most common type of insurance claim against the fraternity industry is for rape. This is a national problem. I was getting threatened. It was working in their favor to silence me. I was terrified. I thought if I told them, they would take action, but the only action they took was against me. We've got a lot further to go. You have always taken on institutions, you know, it seems in your films. Uh, the uh, film you took on with the MPAA, uh, this is Rated X, and uh, also The Invisible War, you took on the U.S. military, and now you're taking on this very, very hot-button topic of campus rape and, and, and the attitudes here. Yeah, I mean, um, I always like to make films about subjects where not only has, has a film not been made about it before, but there really hasn't been a comprehensive book on the subject. I like to be the first into it, and the, obviously it makes it much more challenging, but it's much more exciting. And in this case, you know, we had an issue where this was a problem around the country. This was a problem on thousands of campuses, so we, you know, mounted an incredible investigative journalism project to follow dozens and dozens of stories and we were also catching, and you kind of saw that in the film, we were catching the beginning of the rise of a student movement. So we, we were shooting this before anybody was really covering it in the country, but getting the student movement right as it was beginning and covering it in real time. And that was very exciting. How many times have you been in love? You're always the most beautiful woman in the room. Therese Bellavette. Carol. Tell me you know what you're doing. I never did. And then it changed. She's still my wife. I love her. I can't help you with that. It shouldn't be like this. I know. Todd, you had worked in the era of the 50s before with Far From Heaven. This is very different. This is early 50s. What was it about this, this story that attracted you to want to make this picture? Well, the whole thing came to me in sort of an irresistible package with Phyllis's beautiful adaptation of The Price of Salt, Patricia Highsmith's second novel, and a, and a little known novel that was published under a pseudonym during her lifetime under Claire Morgan due to its overt lesbian content and in some ways due to the fact that it ended optimistically, which, was, which went against the grain of most lesbian fiction of the time. But reading Phyllis's adaptation, reading the book, and knowing that, of course, Kate was already attached to play Carol were all these powerful incentives for, 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 my, for me coming on board. It, it's really, you know, the most exquisite and uh, poignant sort of meditation on, on love, on falling in love. And I felt like I hadn't really explored that in other films I'd done so far, per se. Rooney Mara really reminded me of the young Audrey Hepburn in this. You look at some of that. We've never seen her do something it's like true. this. It's a, it's a, I'd seen her, all, most of her main, main performances up to this point, and been incredibly impressed with her choices, her range, her, her ability to underplay, the sort of courage of that in her. But I'd never seen her do something, in some ways, this simple. Uh, a person kind of coming into focus to herself as a young young woman. Is she do, there are moments where she is uncannily like Audrey Hepburn and also like Jean Seberg, for people who remember Jean Seberg. Phyllis, you knew Patricia Highsmith, and uh, this was written in the early 50s. You could never have made the movie that you made now then. It took all these years. You've been with this a long, long time. So it's been, what, 18 yeah. years or so. Actually, it's been very hard to get made, not so much because of the lesbian content, but I think because it's so female driven, not only in the two leads, but the arguably the third major character is also a woman. They are all gay and none of them um, is fighting over a husband. Well, there's a there's a divorce as we you know, but that's what I think kept it initially from actually attracting uh, significant finance. The times now have changed. I feel now the future. Hail King the Chalpy. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Oh, hell, my best, it shall be. 
be king, you know. You worked with Michael Fassbender before on Shame, right? So how did he come about? We couldn't think of anything, anyone else but him, actually, yeah. for Macbeth. I can remember reading The Battle at the start, and, and so often in adaptations of Macbeth, no one can ever really throw the resources into the, into the battle, and so it's a lot of fog and people stepping over bodies. <laughs> and I thought, God, wouldn't it be brilliant for this film to get made? Then that they passed on that and uh, I thought if ever I become a producer I'll do that and, and I'd worked with through Steve McQueen had, had produced Shame and um, we thought well let's option this material and send it to Michael on a very short option and see whether he says yes and he was equal parts terrified and excited. This here is Daisy Domergue. She's wanted dead or alive for murder. When that sun comes out, I'm taking this woman to hang. Is there anybody here committed to stopping me from doing that? Well, well, well. Looks like Minnie's haberdashery is about to get cozy for the next few days. Yes, it does. No one said this job's supposed to be easy. <laughs> Nobody said it's supposed to be that hard, neither. You guys are daring here. You shot this 70 millimeter. We heard about Quentin talking about that. Nobody does film anymore, and I just applaud Quentin for, for sticking to it. I think that you know the romance of cinema and what going to the theater and what film means to all of us that grew up as passionate lovers of movies as an art form and a, a mi mixed shared popular culture was really important to him. And he wanted to do an epic, wintry Western. And this format was also as good for showing the giant landscapes as it was to get really into the hearts and the minds of, of these men and women who um, are hateful. What was so special about this? It's a Western. It's like a three-hour Western, too, right? It's about three hours, but it's pretty special. We have <laughs> With an overture an and an intermission. And an overture. With inter I love it. It's, okay. it's lovely. It's a great way to see a movie. And we all know a Quentin movie is usually a long movie, so having an intermission is perfect. You can go to the bathroom and do all those things and walk around. The special part of this movie was we all knew he wanted to do shoot the movie in 65 and project it in 70. We talked about it for a while, but then actually reading it on the page, was, okay, here we go, game on, we've got to do this. And the lab had done some things in this, but nothing like this for years. And we sent Bob off to Panavision, and we thought, we're just doing your standard 65. And he w literally went into a room, found these things on a shelf, and Dan Sasaki, who's with Panavision, was like, oh, you found these. We haven't used these since 1966, but let's check them out. So we literally have resurrected these lenses and got them to work on modern camera technology in the span of two months. And that was pretty amazing. We never went down one time because of camera lens and it, it worked flawlessly. 